Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. It's your brother Amir Junaid Muhadif, formerly known as Loon from Bad Boy Records. Right now, I'm chilling with my brother in faith, Big Ed. That's what I call him on the Dean Show. So get your Dean right. You heard? Barakallahu feet. Bismillah, alhamdulillah. Let me give you the best of greetings, the greetings of peace. Peace be unto you. Now, my name is Eddie, and I'm your host of the Dean Show. And I get a chance to sit with a lot of wonderful people, people who have come to acknowledge what the truth is in life. They joined this beautiful brotherhood of over 1.5 billion people from all around the world, the fastest growing way of life in the world today. And my next guest is one of those people. Now, he's a unique individual. He's my brother and your brother. And we want to know why this former rapper, hip hop phenomenon, former bad boy, gone good boy, who was with the likes of Sean, P. Diddy, Cones, hanging out with all the celebrities, and he left that life to live this good life, the life that brought him peace. You're going to find out how he attained something that money couldn't buy. I got a chance to sit with him, and I'm very excited to share his story with all of the viewers of The Dean Show. This week on The Dean Show, Loon, former bad boy gone good boy. Let's find out why. Enjoy this week's show. Dean, Allah, there's only one God and Muhammad is his messenger. Allah, la ilaha illallah. Allah. There's only one God and Jesus was his messenger Allah La ilaha illallah I don't know why I did that. Maybe it's just, maybe it's just to break the ice. Assalamu alaikum. Oh, wa alaikum salam wa salam wa Peace be unto you, my brother. Oh, and also with you, Aki. Now, what was the greeting that you used to have before when you used to see some of the homeboys? Um, you know, what up, son? What's good? Yo, <laughs> what up, yo, son? What's going down? <laughs> now you're saying you're wishing me peace. I'm wishing you peace. It's something Man, new, I'm huh? I'm wishing everybody peace, you know. I mean, Islam has brought peace into my life that I couldn't find, you know, living the lifestyle I was living in the music business. And it feels good to wish peace unto others once I've found the peace for myself. Now, we are excited to hear this story because we get to talk to people who have come from all walks of life. Uh, you know, people have this misnotion that Islam is something just for the Arabs. Yeah. But when they see a, an American who used to be a, or someone who is an icon, people are looking up to you, you're singing with P. Diddy and the, the Bad Boy crew, is that what they're yeah, called? Yeah, Bad Boy Records, Bad Boy Entertainment, you know, P. Diddy, Sean Combs, Sean John, you know. You know, I ran with an entrepreneur. I, I ran with an icon in the music business, and I was exposed to so many things in such a like short period of time. The success of the records that I did with Puff, you know, propelled to be in you know audiences all around the world. It wasn't a country that I couldn't go to that a, per a person couldn't identify with who I was or the songs I created or the records I partaked in. And, and you know, it was just, it's just an overwhelming feeling to be embraced by such a vast audience. But you know, to become a Muslim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has definitely replaced that audience, you know what I'm saying, with a, a whole different light. You know, it's a whole different thing. And the transition has been so beautiful. You know, Allah is most kind. You know, the brothers and sisters that I used to, you know, run with in the music business have embraced my um, conversion to Islam. You know, my family has, you know, embraced my conversion to Islam. And just it's just been smooth sailing, man. Allah's most kind because it's just something that I really needed, you know. And I think a lot of entertainers in that business are searching for the same peace, and you know, may Allah guide them all. Let's talk a little bit about the past. We're not going to go into any details yeah. or anything, but for the benefit of those who are still trying to chase what you were living, they call it the American dream. Yeah. People see the videos yeah. and they see all the rides and they yeah. see the women and the glamour and the glitz. Yeah. But it's not all that. Well, for the most part, I think that a lot of people, you know, mainly, you know, preferably the youth, you know, we all share kind of the same common desires and temptations. And I think the music business kind of breeds these things and it gives people a one-dimensional perception of, you know, 
the, mostly the perks in the business, yeah. so to say. And I think that, you know, the youth, by being so inspired all around the world, you know what I'm saying, being so inspired by this lifestyle, a lot of them who have been born into certain faiths, you know what I'm saying, like Islam and, and things of that nature, you know, they try to incorporate this lifestyle into something that's so beautiful, you know what I'm saying, Islam is just so beautiful. And I've been seeing over the years how, you know, this, this business and this lifestyle has affected so many of the youth. And myself, I think that traveling the world and living this consistent pattern of doing so many sinful things, you know, that come with the business. You know, we actually, you know, have the opportunity to make songs that might not be so vulgar, might not be so, you know, you know, negative. Mm -hmm. But the reality of it is there's a lifestyle that comes with it. And that was the thing that really plagued my life because what you're propelled in based on a success you know, it's a lifestyle that just becomes so repetitive and so consistent. And you find yourself being removed further and further away from a truth, further and further away from peace, further away from anything that was pure about you before you entered the business. So, like I said, you know, on the outside, everything looks good. You see the $100,000 cars. You see a lot of diamonds. You see, you know, for men, for the sake of men, you see a lot of females. And they think that this is, you know, this is a life. This is, this is, like, you know, paradise right here on earth. But the reality of it is, you know, I couldn't purchase peace. You know, I was probably able to buy a car, buy a house, buy a chain. Couldn't purchase peace. And the reality of it is, while we're sitting here, while I'm sitting here constantly paying for the disease, the cure was free. Paying for the disease. Paying for the disease. And the cure is free. And the cure is free. Why are people running away from something that's free to something that's expensive? Because you got to pay for the martinis yeah. and the, I forgot what's even drunk in the club nowadays, the, the Dom Perignons, yeah. and you got to pay for all these things. And But you can get yeah. some water, easy, like, yeah. you know? <laughs> <laughs> And that's what I'm saying. Like I think people treat life like the flu shot. You think you can treat the flu with the flu. Yeah. It's not like that, you know what I'm saying? And what happened was, you know, Allah's guidance is just amazing because I think sincerely in my heart, Allah heard me and heard the oppression that, that, that's hidden, you know what I'm saying, from a lot of us entertainers. You know, we try to forge this image and we try to forge this character that's, you know, saying like suitable for the fan. The fan admires this character, they're drawn to this character, but the reality of it is, we face tragedies no different from normal people. But the reality of it is, we try to go past that and continue to feed the fan, you know, this impression that they desire and that, and that they gravitate to. But me on the other hand, you know, it just got to a point where it was just getting very overwhelming, it was getting very overbearing, and I just found myself searching inside like man I need an answer I need something that's going to give me a, a, a route to just you know alleviate some of these pains and I would try all kinds of things you know sometimes you just be like yo listen I'll just go buy me a hot car maybe I feel better you know maybe if I go buy a chain you know maybe if I go to the spa for about five hours we'll get a seaweed bath and all the you know whole crazy stuff and then you know you get one phone call next thing you know you got not seeing back again or you drive the car, you know all the features in the car is no fun no more. Or you wear the chain and after a while the chain is just kind of boring because, you know, everything upgrades as you go. And I found myself like I can't find peace chasing this methodology. So what happened, I was fortunate to do a, a song with an artist from Canada, you know, a brother named Masari. He was a um, Lebanese artist. And when I did the song, the song didn't really do good in the States. But it kind of propelled into a market that I never knew even existed. Mm -hmm. And it was in the Muslim market, in the Islamic market. And what happened was I, I got, you know, called to do shows in like Muscat, Oman, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and things of this nature. Even I, I performed in Kazakhstan. I performed in a lot of countries, even in West Africa. And I found myself running to Islam, keep running into Islam. And once you get past the whole little butterflies and the things that come with the, um, you know, the entertainment aspect, I started to get drawn to other things that came with my journey. And that was the, like the event being called. The event being called in the city, like, just rain through the whole city. Everybody would just stop. You could hear people breathing. This is like, this is a song that I heard that was more beautiful than any song I've ever wrote in my life. That's the Muslim call to prayer. The Muslim call to prayer, you know. Yeah. And then, like I said, at some point, you find yourself trying to shop within, between Dhu and Asa. 
Everyone's taking the sun in that. Mm -hmm. You know, I come from New York City. Everything is 24 hours. I've never seen anybody shut down in midday. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And all this is for the sake of Allah. All this is for the sake of God. And it's like, this was so consistent. You know, every place I went, I just seen this whole consistent practice of worshiping the one true God. And this was something that I was looking for. This is something I wanted to be a part of because there's a lot of inconsistency the way people practice and worship, you know, saying God. And what I saw in the Muslim was very consistent. And I just couldn't, you know, I couldn't tear myself away from it. After a while, I started to see and study, ask questions. I would go to certain bookstores, buy books, and just found myself getting more and more drawn to trying to learn this culture, learn this lifestyle, and learn this religion. <clears throat> so while I was in the UAE, I found myself, you know, pretty much, you know, at the last leg of this whole party thing. And, you know... I actually seen the sunrise while I was in Abu Dhabi and um, I was staying at the Emirates Palace. And I watched the sunrise and I'm looking at the Arabian Sea and I'm just saying to myself, like, this is just beautiful, man. This is just beautiful. And it's like all the misconceptions that you see in the media about the Muslim, you know, all of these things were quickly getting dispelled, you know. And I start seeing, like, maybe the media is only, you know, Establishing 3% of Islam Because everywhere I'm going I'm seeing just the exact opposite I'm seeing streets you can eat off I'm seeing people with hospitality is just amazing Everywhere you go Someone's offering you tea Someone's offering you dates Someone's offering you help You know people that are, are very less fortunate Than the people that I used to hang with I'm hanging with multi-millionaires They got yachts You know what I'm saying Mansions, penthouses and things of this nature And it's hard to even extract the, uh, a cold soda from them mm -hmm. You know And then to be around people who who, who really didn't have much, were always willing to give, you know, and, not, and want nothing in return, you know, because they feel that their blessings come from Allah. And that's a concept that I, I could incorporate in my life because I was a giving person. I was a person that overasserted myself for the sake of success, for the sake of bringing success to other people, for the sake of helping other people find success. But the benefit at the time, I was looking for the return to come from the people I was helping. But then I learned that that's not where I'm supposed to be looking. I'm supposed to seek refuge in the one that created me. So I found myself, you know, being engulfed by this concept and just being overwhelmed and just, man, blown away. And I say, you know, I want to be a Muslim. Now, did you have any exposure to any other religions, anything else oh, that yeah. you looked into? Can you talk about this briefly? Well, I was born in a Christian household. You know, my grandmother, she sung in the United Negro College Fun Choir for about 40 years. I used to spend maybe six, seven days a week in the church. And, you know, I was heavy, heavily active in, you know, in Christian activity, you know, saying Bible studies. I played the piano. I played the bells. I was an usher. I did everything that you could possibly do in the, in the infrastructure of, you know, the Baptist church. And, you know, I just started to notice a lot of, you know, inconsistencies, you know, people who say they're of God doing things that are not of God. And it's not that, you know, because even in Islam, you're not supposed to judge the Muslim, you know, judge Islam by the Muslim. Yeah. So I'm not saying that I was judging the Christian by, you know, but the reality of it was it was so repetitive, the inconsistencies and in how things were practiced and how things were done. And I really started to ask questions, you know, because you have people that, you know, believe that Jesus is God. And I used to ask myself as a child, how is Jesus God if he prays? Who's he praying to? Mm -hmm. And it's just certain little questions that I wanted answers for that I couldn't find within the infrastructure. It's a good so. question. Who was he praying to? That's what you're saying? Yeah, you're saying. exactly. Like, these are, these are like common sense questions. Mm -hmm. These are not something that really take rocket science. Yeah. And, you know, and it, even like with Adam and Eve, I'm like, how are we held accountable for the sins of two, like the first, you know, man and woman created, like, how am I, like, why am I to blame? I never met Adam, I never met Eve. Why would I be held accountable? That would make God unjust, you know, when we know that God is so merciful and God is the most just. So these are just little questions that I kept, you know, wanting answers for and I couldn't find it within the infrastructure. 